Okay, so um, the people who were absent yesterday, you should have out a clean sheet of paper that you're not going to turn in today, but that you need to keep up with because the notes will be graded and this assignment will be turned in. And if you lose it, um, obviously there's no way to get you points for it. No matter if I see you working on it right now or not, you better sit up. On the top of your paper, on the right hand side, um, I want you to put the following heading and not in that white space. Don't put it in that white space. I want you to start on the first blue line. Start on the first blue line and put your full first and last name, right hand side. Okay, on the right hand side of your paper. Full first and last name. Not first name and last initial, full first and last name on the blue line. Second blue line. On that second blue line, and give yourself plenty of room to put this. Second blue line, put the date. Today is the um, right hand side. Um, today is the 17th of September. Young, sit up, please. 17th of September. If you have your cell phone out, go ahead and put it away. We're finished with them so far. 17th of September. Drop down to the third line, and you're going to put the class fourth hour speech. Fourth hour speech is the class. Fifth, uh, fourth line is the assignment title, and this is um, no. informative speech. Informative speech. All right, so remember uh, last week we watched uh, the Christmas Carol, and uh, you were supposed to take notes on that. Uh, if you did not see it, if you came in on the last few uh, minutes of it, or if you didn't see it at all, I'll put that link on the classroom, and it's up to you to go uh, catch it on your own time. So maybe over the weekend, it's uh, almost two hours long. So maybe you want to break it up like we broke it up and just watch little portions of it throughout the week. But this is what we're writing on. So your first speech is based on that. You're going to inform us about that. We're going to uh, talk about what that means to inform. So I'll put that link on the Google Classroom. It'll be up to you to watch that on your own and take notes. Okay, uh, you have to have at least a total of 20 different notes because we watched it for about four or five days and we took five notes each day. So you should have at least a total of about 20 to 25 notes. No more, no less than 20. No less than 20 different notes. You're supposed to number them and you're going to use that to help you develop your paper but then you're also going to turn that in. Then you this is your objective. Define, if you have a question, Jada, please raise your hand. Define and construct an informative essay. And this is your objective. So after your line four with your title, drop down and write your objective. So remember, every single time that we start a new lesson, you should have an objective, which is always going to be in red. And this is what I expect for you to learn by the end of the lesson. Go to... Um, Google, and you're supposed to Google uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. And when you get there, so you might want to write this down because I'm about to take it down so we can move on. Um, but when you get there, you're going to define the word exposition. And so they have an alphabet list that's already on there. And when you Google it, make sure you don't click on the book. Look for the website. Look for the website that says Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms. So you're doing just a little bit of research. And when you get there, they have it alphabetized. Click on E and scroll down. You might have to go to a different page. So at the bottom, it gives you a number of pages that you can click on. You might have to go to the uh, second or third page in order to find exposition. But you write down the definition. Then I said to go to uh, dictionary.com and define the word explain. And some people didn't do this second part. So make sure you have that in your notes when you get a chance to. But you're supposed to copy the uh, second, third, and fourth definitions from dictionary.com. Marie, sit up, please. Second, third, and fourth definitions. Brian, sit up, please. So make sure that that's in your um, notes. Okay. Now we've discussed what we found. Uh, Whetstone uh, gave us uh, our findings yesterday, and I think uh, Lemuria did also. Okay. So you should have those two in there. This is the meat and potatoes of what we're studying. Okay. This is the meat and potatoes. So when we say an informative text, what we mean is an exposition. When we say an informative text, what we mean is we're going to explain. 
So now you know what an exposition is, and now you know what explain means. Okay, one more time, can someone give me the definition of um, exposition from their notes? Okay, Lemuria. Okay, the setting forth of a systematic explanation. A systematic explanation, you're setting this forth, you're putting this out there for people who don't know. Okay? It's systematic, which means it's planned out. You're ironing and increasing out everything that you're trying to say. You have a certain system and organization about how you're going about giving this information to people. Okay? It's an explanation, which, which is why we went to explain. And when we went to explain, Mr. Weston, what did we say it meant for us to explain? To make known in detail. Okay, to make known in detail. So that means that this is probably information that people don't know. So you're making it known and you're giving them detail about it, whatever the subject matter is. Next. To assign meaning to. So you introduce something. And again, it may be something that people don't know, and so you're assigning meaning to it. You introduced it, you're assigning meaning to it. Next. To make clear the cause Okay, to make clear the cause or reason of why are you introducing this to us. Okay, so, majority of the time when I start off a lesson, uh, so that was your do now. You should have that down. Um, so you should have your heading. Uh, your objective and your uh, do not. Uh, students will copy five facts from the video. Afterwards, we will discuss what you found. Okay, so the video is about seven minutes long. So you have five, Bryant, I said to lift your head up. So you're gonna, uh, you have about seven minutes, so you only need five facts. And that means you have more than enough minutes to find at least five facts. Here we go. Hey guys, welcome to this video about insurance. Okay, that was a little loud, sorry. Hey guys, welcome to this video about informative text. It's easy to think about informative text as writing that provides information, but it's more than that. Not only does informative text have its own style, but there are four types of informative text. We'll go over that and more in this video. Let's start by answering the question, what is informative text? Informative text educates the reader about a specific topic. It's a unique type of writing. You'll see it in a number of different mediums. Okay, if you wanted that, I'm going to go back to it, just in case you wanted that. She said, in forms of text, educates the reader about a specific topic. So you're putting this on the same page as the heading and objective, or at the end you're going to stick with them together, whichever one, but all this stuff goes together. Your notes get graded, you're going on the same paper, just the same exact assignment. <coughs> Sorry, Homa! Excuse me. Oh, okay, excuse me. Okay, let's keep going of writing. You'll see it in a number of different mediums. A manual with instructions for putting together a desk. A book that provides information on a vacation to a specific place. A nonfiction book that examines World War II. All are examples of informative texts. Informative texts can appear in newspapers, textbooks, reference materials, and research papers. Okay, so here's a little um, note about taking notes. When you're taking notes and you're listening, you might have to uh, memorize the phrase that you want to write down by repeating it in your brain. 
And so that means you have to tune out everything else. Then they'll take that out of your ear, please. So that means that you'll have to tune out everything else that's being said and re keep repeating that phrase until you write it down. Okay? Keep repeating that phrase until you write it down because we're not going to keep stopping the video. Okay, so that's how you take notes. When you hear something important, hurry up and keep repeating it until you write it down. And it's kind of like swimming. Yeah, you hold your breath when you go down, then you come back up for air. So when you finish writing it down, come back up and start listening again. Informative text is always non-fiction. This type of writing also has certain characteristics that make this style easier to identify. Let's take a look at those. Informative text contains a number of aids that make it easier for readers to follow along and get the information they need. Written cues, graphics, illustrations, and organizational structure are all aids you'll find in informative text. We'll start... Okay, just in case you want that. She said these are all things that you will find in informative text. Written cues, graphics, illustrations, and an organizational structure. Ms. Collins is using her phone wisely. She's taking a picture of something that she wanted to write down and she's copying it from her phone. So listening to music is not one way to use it, but using it for notes is a way that you can use your phone. Let's keep going. By looking at written cues. You'll notice these written cues in books. The table of contents at the front of the book makes it That's easy a written for readers table of contents. to see where they can find specific information. The index found at the end of the book neatly lists all of the That's topics another written and the page index. numbers that denote the location of those topics. If you're confused by what a word or phrase means, you can check the glossary of terms the glossary which is another written definitions. Cube. There might even be an appendix which provides additional informative text it's on another written specific cube appendix. Subject. So how is this informative text organized? Informative text uses types fonts, and labels to help readers find information. Uh, types, fonts, and labels is how it's organized. Types, fonts, and labels, if you want that. Types, fonts, and labels is how it's organized. Types, fonts, and labels. A bold word creates emphasis and tells reader this is important. A phrase set in italics is similar. It adds extra emphasis on an important word or a phrase. Numbered or bulleted lists set apart important information in an orderly fashion. Authors might use headings, subheadings, and labels to also denote importance. Those are all ways informative text can organize content. What other techniques do authors use? Informative text may contain graphics to help the reader understand the subject. Think of a biology book you've recently used. When studying the human body, you'll see a diagram that shows the location of vital organs and systems, like the brain, heart, and lungs. That's an example of an informative diagram. It shows you the information while providing some explanatory text. In math books, you'll see charts that explain how to analyze algebraic equations. You'll find tables that explain the periodic table of elements. Those maps that show the location of countries, that's also informative. Flow diagrams, sketches, and maps are all examples of other graphics used in informative texts. But graphics aren't the only visual aids. Illustrations provide additional visual techniques in informative text. In the graphics section, I use the example of how authors can graphically represent the brain, heart, and lungs. With illustrations, we can take that one step further. For example, you can focus on one part of the heart by magnifying a specific area. That gives the reader even more information and the ability to study the pulmonary artery, the aorta, or the ventricles in greater detail. Photos are also used for illustrative purposes. Written cues, so illustrations are photos. Illustrations, illustrations Those are, are pictures. Those are all the characteristics of informative texts. Now, let's 
Let's take a look at the four different types of informative text. Books can be excellent sources of informative text. Biographies on historical figures fall under the informative category. Technical books on computer software are also informative. So are picture books on astronomy or the earth. Literary nonfiction, like memoirs, essays, and autobiographies also fall into these categories. While poetry is known for its illusion, this style of literature... Okay, so she's talking about all the uh, literary type of... So just like it says at the top, literature, informative text, these are the different types of uh, literary, nonfiction, informative text. So, informative texts are always non-fiction. What does it mean to be non-fiction? Danielle, I want that completely off your ear, please. It's not real. Brian? Same thing, okay. So, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, fiction means that it's been created, it's made up. Okay? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Um, I'm sorry, I, I got, uh, that, that's the opposite. Fiction means that it's uh, made up. Nonfiction means that it is real. So it, it is See, real. Sorry. So uh, so these are all types of books that are giving real accounts on things in probably everyday life. So technical books. So you know you might go to. Um, AutoZone, you know, and get a book based on your car and find out how to do your own brakes. Uh, you know, picture books, uh, memoirs, okay, memoirs is when you take a certain segment of your life and you turn it into a story. An essay, there's different types of essays, okay, this is an essay, informative, uh, ess informative writing, that's considered types of essays, autobiographies, when you write about your own and, um, entire life, and then uh, she said poetry also. Also Shalana Lucas, please report to the main office. Shalana Lucas, report to the main office. So she's talking about poetry right here. Informative writing. So long as the poetry contains factual information. This type of informative literary nonfiction tends to be shorter. Expository writing has a different set of characteristics. Expository writing has those written cues we discussed at the beginning of the video. These books contain a table of contents, an index, and a glossary. These are all tools that let readers scan through material and pick what they want to read. The table of contents, organized by chapter, gives readers a chance to skip over certain types of information. For example, when reading a book about Earth, you may be fascinated by geology, but not so much by geophysics. The table of contents will guide you to the geology portion of the book. Babe Ruth is the greatest baseball player to ever live. Global warming is not fake. Dogs are better than cats. These are all argumentative positions, and the author must try to persuade the reader through data and analysis. The author produces the claims, makes the arguments, and hopes that readers believe he's right in the end. The last type of informative text is much different from the argumentative style. Procedural texts provide a step-by-step -step guide for a user. A cookbook is a good example of a procedural text. The recipes provide an ingredient-by-ingredient -ingredient guide to create a specific dish. If you're hanging a television using a wall mount, the mount will come with step-by-step -step instructions. If you're putting something together, chances are you're looking at procedural writing. So those are the four types of informative writing. Literary nonfiction, which tends to be shorter writing. Expository writing, which is written cues that make it easier for readers to scan information. Argumentative or persuasive writing, which advocates a point of view. And procedural writing, a step-by-step -step guide. That's our look at informative text, the writing technique that seeks to inform with facts. I hope that this overview was helpful. If you enjoyed it, then be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Yes. Procedural. Okay. Um, to, um, to which part? It's, it was time to go now. But uh, keep your. Okay. 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 All right.
Uh, take out your orange language network book underneath your desk and open up to page 412. And let's share some of the things that we got from the video. What were some of the notes that we copied from the video while you're opening up to 412, the orange language network book? Uh, Brian. Brian. Come on. 412. Somebody toss out some notes that they collected from the video. What was one thing to Danielle? Okay, informative text educates the reader about a specific subject. Okay? So uh, we got that from here. Uh, give me your name again. Nevea. What we got? It's always nonfiction. Good, and we discussed that yesterday because uh, someone said that it was uh, nonfiction was something that was uh, make believe, and um, that's incorrect. Nonfiction is something that is real. It's not make believe. Fiction is uh, make believe. So, if you think of fiction, think of fake. Okay, fiction is fake. Nonfiction is actually real. Uh, Brian. Okay. Um, one style of informative text is procedural. Okay, that's one where you get a step by step. It's kind of like a manual to how to put something together. Okay. Anyone else? I thought I saw someone else with their head. All right. So we are on page 412, and since we looked at some literature, the story, um, we're going to discuss our response to it. Okay, we're going to inform our audience about what happened, and not only about what happened, but how we responded to the literature. So let's go to the top of 412. Everyone should be following along while someone brave is reading. Who's that brave person that's going to read? Lemuria. Loud, please. Learn what it is. Yep. Learn what it is. How do you put a Hold on for one second. I'm sorry. Deshaun, I said everyone is reading along. Everyone is reading along. Uh, Jamar, everyone is reading along. So your eyes should be on the same words that she's reading. Yes. Learn what it is. How do you put up here with the same Do you think about the message? Do you identify the characters? Write in a personal response to literature as this can help you clarify your business about the story or more. It, also, it may also gain some insights Thank you. So, again, just for the people who couldn't uh, hear too well, how do you feel after you read a book or see a movie? Okay? Do you think about the message? Do you identify with the character? Write a personal response to literature essay. So, this is, remember, we said an essay in the video is a type of nonfiction. Uh, it's a type of nonfiction informative text, Weston. Uh, writing a personal response to a literature essay can help you clarify your feelings about a story or poem. It may also help you gain some insight into your own life as well as the world around you. So, a lot of times, the reason that we're looking at literature is because the author has taken the character through a certain storyline because this is something that we can benefit from. So they're like, well, you know what? Certain people probably struggle with this in life, and so I'm gonna take this character through a certain amount of drama, and once they get through their conflicts and situations, people will probably understand how to handle them in their own life, okay? Uh, and you may have a response after you watch a movie, or after you read a book, for those who like to read. I know one movie that really sparked a lot of responses from people was last year, uh, or maybe it was earlier, it was, I think it was earlier this year when the movie Bird Box came out. How many people saw Bird Box? Everybody. Okay. A lot of people had, it was on Netflix, so if you saw it, it was, it was on there. But a lot of people uh, had a response. Not many people knew the message. So when it says, uh, do you think about the message? A lot of people thought about the message. But I don't think a lot of people really understood the message, though. But uh, we'll talk about that a different time. But 
a lot of people had a response because I think they were confused about, about the message, so they had a response to it because of the confusion that it sparked. Okay? Okay, and so, uh, are, or do you identify with a character? Maybe that character is just like you or like a family member or friend that you know of. And so this is what we're going to do in this paper. You're going to tell us what the Christmas Carol was about, but also what was your reaction or response to it, and then how did it relate to your life or someone that you know. All of that is going to be in your paper. So that's what you're informing us about today or explaining to us as we define, uh, explain. So in this expositional piece, that's what we mean to do. Um, all right, what I want you to do is to take notes on the rubric where it says basics in a box, and it says rubric. These are your standards for writing. Can I have someone to read the first bullet point? And we're going to create an actual rubric to this so you know how to cater your specific paper exactly to that rubric. You'll know what's an A paper, what's a C paper, what, what's an F paper. Keep your head up. So you're writing this down, and someone is going to read it while we're writing it. So the first bullet point says what? A successful response to literature should what? Okay, we're writing that down. So wake up, we're writing that down. So a successful one will do this. On our rubric, there will be a specific slot for the criteria of including an introduction that identifies the literary work and clearly states your overall response to it. So in your first paragraph, remember I said it's going to be about four to five paragraphs, in your first paragraph you're going to introduce, uh, this is um, an essay about a Christmas carol by so-and-so, because we answered questions on that, uh, the questions that I uh, gave and we went to the library for, we answered questions about who the author was, we're right. So the first piece of criteria is going to be your introduction paragraph. And you got to open things a certain type of way to keep the reader wanting to read more. you got to introduce it to it. What are you writing about? Number two, the second bullet point says what? A successful response to literature should what? Right. Yeah. Thank you. It should tell enough about the literary work so that readers can understand your response. So the second thing that you're doing in, um, on your paper, in your paper, in the second paragraph probably, is giving us a brief synopsis or summary about what the story of Christmas Carol is about. So you're not going to take up paragraphs telling, retelling the story. That's not what this is about. You're, but you are going to tell us a little bit about what it is. Second bullet point, then get all the bullet points out. So you do have to tell us what was it about. So that's what your notes were for. So use your notes to guide you in this part. So your perspective on it was probably something totally different from someone else's. So when someone else is up here informing us about what it was about, you know, maybe you're like, wow, I didn't see it that way, but I can now understand that point of view again. Next one. What's the third bullet point? You're going to read it for us. Okay, uh, Lumeria. Thank you. Okay, a successful response to literature should also contain clearly described specific responses to the literary work. Okay, so. We should understand clearly what was your response to it. What was your response to it, very clearly? A Christmas carol. Okay, it made me feel this way. It made me react that way. Mm -hmm. Next one, fourth one. You're going to read the fourth one. Someone else besides Brian, who's uh, about to get a food snack to participate. Let's go. Okay, you're going to uh, learn how to support your statement with 
quotations and details. So that means, what does quotations mean? Okay, good. She was doing this for quotation marks. What does that mean when something goes in quotation marks? Um, you, are, you are identifying it with emphasis, but why? Why is it important? Okay. It's a quote. Good. Means that someone, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Which means that someone said it. Which means you're taking this information specifically from a source, word by word. And when you do that, you have to learn how to cite that source. Otherwise, it's called plagiarism. Okay. There's a lot of copyright laws uh, against claiming someone else's words as your own. So whenever you put words that are not your own into uh, a paper of yours, you have to cite where they come from. And we'll show you how to do that. Uh, but you need to give us some examples with quotations and details. Huh? Um, not exactly, but we'll go over uh, what that looks like. Uh, next person, you want to read the next bullet point? Okay, last bullet point. A successful response to literature should... Use language and details that are appropriate for your audience. Use uh, language and details that are appropriate for your audience. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about what that looks like, but um, obviously your audience is your students, your classmates, and myself. Not people on the block. You see in the diagram where it says body, okay, uh, and we're not talking about your body, we're talking about the body of your essay. We see that it says evidence in there, and the evidence is the quotations and the details. So you're going to provide us stuff, specific stuff from the actual uh, play so that we know, oh yeah, this is backing up what you're saying. You had this type of reaction because you made it made it it made you feel like this, and it made you feel like this because this happened. This came specifically from there. Yes. Okay, here's some um, additional notes that I just want you to um, copy down and then we're going to move on to the next part of it. These are the steps for writing an informative essay. So the first one says, collect the most important uh, information. So you should have done that already. So we uh, that was the reason for watching, we're writing this down. So we're writing this down right off the projector screen. So that was the reason for watching A Christmas Carol in the first place and asking you to take notes is because you were supposed to collect the most important information. And in any informative essay, you have to collect information. Next up, predict the reader's questions and then answer them. Predict the reader's questions and then answer them. So, obviously, if you introduce a brand new topic to people, it's probably going to raise some questions. Hopefully, they have questions, so you get a chance uh, to explain. So you have a reason to explain. So obviously, that would give you a purpose for what you're doing. Next one. Use enough details to thoroughly Thank inform you the, the reader. Question. Frank Carter, please report to the main office. Frank R. Carter, please report to the main office. Use enough details to thoroughly inform the reader. And then, use enough details to thoroughly inform the reader. Teach the reader something new is D. Teach the reader something new. Teach the reader something new. And then explain unusual words or terms. And then explain unusual words or terms. So these are the steps, the five steps to writing an informative essay. Okay, and if you are that type of person who likes to bring new information to the table, then you like to inform. So this is like one of the reasons that I wanted to be a teacher is because I love to 
bring new information to the table and make people say, huh? And then that gives me purpose to have to explain what I'm talking about. Even if I'm entering a conversation just with friends. You know, maybe it's Tuesday and we're talking about the football game. So that means that on Monday night, I watch Monday night football and I have something to contribute to the conversation. And so I listen to the commentators say historical things. Oh, this player is the first person to do this and do that. And then I come back to the conversation and I present that because maybe someone doesn't know that. And so I'm presenting something new. So that gives me purpose in that conversation. So anything that's uh, unusual, we're going to explain that in depth. Okay, so this segment of the lesson would be considered the class practice. And even though it's just me by myself right now, really this was done with the students and we read through it together and we discussed it together. And what we were discussing is how the student model actually adhered to the rubric. So we took notes on the rubric and all the components. There were five different areas. And now we're gonna see the rubric in action. So first of all, notice how where it says, the first thing that's identified is the title of the author and the main characters of the literary work in the introduction. So the introduction is your first paragraph and that's where you're gonna introduce what's going on, but it's also considered the exposition of a story or a paper. So you're gonna give the information in the background of what's going on. So this is gonna be the one where you're gonna give a summary, a brief summary of what's going on in the actual Christmas Carol story. Now this one you see is a personal response to the story called The Necklace, but yours is gonna be a Christmas Carol's because that's what we're focusing on in this lesson. So we're gonna see how in this first paragraph, the story of The Necklace is actually introduced with the title of the author and some of the main characters. So it says, as we read, in the story, the short story that is, The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant, Madame Loisel, a middle-class woman, longs to be rich, but finds, uh, I'm sorry, but finds out that trying to appear rich comes as a wasted sacrifice. When she and her husband get the opportunity to attend a high-class reception, she goes for, she goes to a friend, Madame Forestier, to borrow a beautiful diamond necklace. Unfortunately, when Madame Loisel returns from the reception, the necklace is gone. After she and her husband search everywhere without success, they decide they must replace the necklace. They borrow money from friends and money lenders to pay a jeweler 36,000 francs for a new necklace, which they return to Madame Forestier. And so just in that first paragraph, we see that we're introduced to the main characters, Madame Moiselle, Madame uh, Forestier, and uh, Madame Moiselle's husband. And we're introduced to the actual situation. They're invited to a reception, and in the reception, they lose the necklace, and they spend the rest of the story trying to build up the money to pay for the necklace. So we understand what the plot and the main situation is. And so we go down to the next paragraph and we see that here in this one, uh, this tells enough about the story so that readers can understand the writer's response. So again, we're summarizing the story in this uh, second paragraph, and then we're going to get to the writer's actual response to the story. But we're just building up enough background so we can understand what the response would be. So we continue reading. The couple spent the next 10 years working off their debts. Madame Loisel does heavy housework and her husband works evenings to balance a trade men's accounts. After the 10 years of struggle, Madame Loisel sees Madame Forestier and explains what she had done in order to pay for the replacement diamond necklace. It is then that Madame Forestier informs Madame Loisel that the necklace was not diamond, but only cut glass. Now, 
that was the area where the story was finished being explained, the summary that is. And now we're going to see where the actual writer describes the personal response to the story. So we're finished giving a summary. We're not going to spend very much time giving a summary of it because uh, especially because your audience is considered the teacher and the students, we can reasonably accept that in this particular class, the students already know what the story is because we all watched it. You're just giving your own personal response to it. So very little time on how you perceived it um, in the first paragraphs of, of the summary, that is. So here's the response. While reading this story, I felt great sorrow and sympathy for Madame Loisel and her husband. I also felt that the story carries two important lessons. Now, these, uh, this division of the two important lessons is what's going to carry out more paragraphs. So if you're wondering how are you going to bulk up this paper, you're going to bulk it up by having something to explain. Because remember, this is an exposition. This is an informative. You're informing us of your response, but you're explaining something also. And so you have to gather up something to be able to explain and inform. So here's the lessons. One of the lessons shown in the necklace is that we should appreciate what we have. Although Madame Loisel is actually pretty fortunate, she does not appreciate it. And so here's a clear example from the text, an example of Madame Loisel not appreciating her wealth and what she has. And so this particular paragraph right here is actually a quote from the story. But you don't see quotations because uh, in MLA style, longer quotes do not have to be put in quotation marks. And they're actually uh, centered in between the paragraph. If it's more than about two sentences, you do that. And we'll explain that when we uh, go over MLA style. So here's an example of the lesson of her being ungrateful. She grieved incessantly, feeling that she had been born for all the little niceties and luxuries of living. She grieved over the shabbiness of her apartment, the dinginess of the walls, the worn out appearance of the stairs, the ugliness of the draperies. And we cl uh, flip over. Madame Loisel does not stop to think of all the things she does have, but instead thinks of what she does not have and what is wrong with what she does have. Here's a quote here. And so notice how this quote actually is not put um, in that paragraph form in the center of the page. It's actually just blended in with the paragraph and it, it is given the regular quotation marks because it's just about one sentence. So this comes straight from the story, and that's why it goes in quotation marks. She would dream, and so this would be that evidence, I'm sorry, uh, this would be that evidence that you saw from the uh, previous page in the body. This is the evidence that's coming straight from the story. She would dream of silent chambers draped with oriental tapestries and lighted with or lighted by tall bronze floor lamps and of two handsome butlers. When the Loisels, so now we're back to the original writer speaking, when the Loisels are paying for the necklace, though, she experiences, and now we're back to another quote, the horrible life, the needy life. And I'm assuming that should be uh, the needy life and not needy life with a V. I'm assuming that's a spelling error. After Madame Loisel works for 10 years, she probably feels she would do anything to have her old life back. So notice how we have the word probably because the writer is still explaining the lesson that was probably learned. So we're still explaining the reaction that the writer has had to the story, the necklace. And so uh, the next uh, rubric and action bullet point says that this part supports statements with quotations and details, as I had just explained. So this would be the actual evidence to back up what it is that. Uh, you're saying your response was to. Now, here's the second lesson, which they already discussed that there were two lessons. And now here's the detailed version of each lesson. And here's the second one. The second lesson is that it is better to be truthful and honest than to lie and hide something. When the Loisels discover the necklace is gone, they decide to cover up for what had happened. 
Instead of going to Madame Forestier and explaining, they chose to lie about it. It turns out that if they had told the truth, they could have saved themselves from 10 long years of hard work. In the end, Madame Forestier says, why, at most, it was only worth 500 francs. <sighs> this was a small amount to pay compared to the 36,000 francs the Loisels had spent for the diamond necklace. Next paragraph. The necklace reminded me of a time in my own life when I thought that an alternate plan was preferable to telling the truth. Luckily, the consequences of my actions weren't as severe as the ones felt by the Loisels. The story proves in a very powerful way that no matter how much anger or pain it causes, telling the truth is usually the best route to take in solving a problem. So uh, this is the last, and remember we have five bullet points, and so this is the last bullet point for the rubric in action. The writer concludes by describing some of her thoughts about the life generated by the story. I'm sorry, uh, some of her thoughts about life generated by the story. And so you should be able in your conclusion paragraph not to necessarily restate what you've already covered, which is usually what you would do in a conclusion. But in the conclusion of this one, I want you to focus on and this is what kind of personalizes it for each individual person so that no one uh, particular response sounds alike. Personalize it to yourself. Bring it back to you. How did the Christmas Carol relate to your life or someone in your life? What was the overall message, the lesson learned, the main idea? And how can you see that playing out in your own life through something that you've learned or experienced or through your own life, experiencing it through someone else, their problems, their trials, their tribulations? So um, take the opportunity in your conclusion to go ahead and explain it from your own lens. And that helps to uh, individualize this assignment for each person, since we're all describing the same story. But hopefully you were able to see how the rubric in action took place in this student model, and that's how you use each bullet point to uh, make sure that your paper adheres to the rubric's 100% um, achievement. And if you have any questions, be sure to let me know in class. So the last thing that I want to call attention to from the rubric is the last bullet point where it says, use language and details that are appropriate for your audience. And basically uh, what I want you to take notice of are two links that I will put on the video. I will attach two links to this video and there'll be links to other videos and those will basically be the um, other examples, digital examples of a response uh, to literature type of informative essay. And so this is a digital age. And so I wanted to provide digital examples of how people still do this, but through a different medium. And I want you to look at the two videos because they're they're both very different, but they're both very much alike. So they're both doing a reaction on to the new music video by artist Missy Elliott to the very same song that she just came out with called Throw It Back. But when it says to make sure that uh, you are adhering to uh, language that might appeal to your audience and be appropriate for your audience, I want you to keep in mind who your audience is. Anytime you're speaking, you want to keep in mind of who your audience is because you want to be able to capture their attention because you're looking for a certain response. So just know that in an informative paper, you're always looking to inform or to explain. And so your uh, general purpose is to inform, but your more specific purpose here is to explain your reaction to the story of a Christmas carol. And so you're writing an informative essay, uh, but it is a personal response. It is a reaction paper. Okay. And so your audience is going to be for your classmates, maybe friends, but also for your teacher. And so I want you to look at the two uh, video response uh, video responses to the Missy Elliott song. And I want you to notice that one 
is uh, more appropriate to your age group and that would cater more towards your classmates, which would just be, it would be totally fine if you use a more relaxed, informal type of language or jargon for that paper. So maybe if you put some slang in your paper, that would be perfectly appropriate for that audience because it would keep their attention and it would probably achieve the purpose that you were looking for in the first place. Okay, which was to really give them your uh, your real reaction instead of dressing it up in a professional manner if you know that that's not how you really respond. And so look at how the uh, younger African-American gentlemen respond to the Missy Elliott video. And that would be the more informal uh, uh, video response. And then look at the one from the uh, Canadian uh, Entertainment Tonight uh, YouTube uh, reaction video to the Missy Elliott song. And notice how theirs is more professional. So uh, they use more professional jargon. It's more formal and um, it, it's dressed up and edited in such a way that it would meet the criteria of television. Missy Elliott. Yes. Only gave fans about 10 hours notice that she'd be dropping new music today. Iconology is the first collection of music from Missy in 14 years. Yeah, Missy tweeted, I am grateful for all the love y'all show me. Uh, it do not go unnoticed. But still, and both of them, I want you to notice before the video actually starts, they provide enough information on the background just like we said in our rubric, we, we provide information of the title and the author and we summarize what's going on. So they, they give some facts about who Missy Elliott is and uh, the fact that they're about to do a video reaction on Throw It Back. And so, you know, that's their purpose and that's the author and that's the title. And then they also play bits and pieces from the uh, actual song. So they give us, that's basically the quote from the song itself. And so that's the evidence right there. And then they also give us their reaction. So in the actual uh, student model in the book, we read about the reaction, but in the videos, we saw their reactions. And so I want you to notice the difference because we're going to um, experience your reaction because you'll be verbally informing us of it, but you can also display it in body language and in your uh, informal jargon also when you're speaking, because this is not just a paper. Remember, this is a speech. So I, I want you to remember that when you're up there at the podium, you are giving us your actual reaction. So don't forget to dress it up exactly how it was, but present it in a way that is professional on one end, but also a way that is completely authentic to your real reaction and how you would have presented it in real time. So just keep that in mind. Look at the two differences in the two videos and just notice how they have a lot alike in, and they, they're different on purpose because they have two different audiences in mind. All right, so um, number four is very easy. You're writing fictional or non-fictional. Informative texts are always fictional or non-fictional. Okay, uh, just a quick little recap. Come uh, on, I don't know if you have question number four, but you're just rewording the five steps into your own answers. So uh, step number one said to, for example, said collect um, the most important information. That's the first step to writing an informative text, collect the most important information. You can reword that into your own words by saying, get uh, uh, the most relevant details. Get the most relevant details, get the most um, relevant or the most essential. So I can keep uh, replacing important with relevant, essential. Remember you can use a thesaurus to replace some of those words. You can replace information with data, facts, all that. Collect can be replaced. All words can be replaced. All right. So number four, just one or two, one or two words, fictional or non-fictional. Number five. Uh, what is its purpose? Okay. What is the purpose of uh, writing 
an uh, expositional paper, an informative paper. We're writing an informative paper to do what? What's the root word in there? Inform. Okay. Okay. We're writing. Um, so the purpose of uh, an informative essay is to teach somebody something. Remember, we're trying to show them something that they possibly don't know, and we want to give all the details on it so that they do know about the time that we're finished. So the purpose is to inform. Now, your mo more specific purpose, if you turn to page 4, 415, you'll see the more specific purpose right there. So once you put the inform, put the next purpose, which, which is what, Weston? No, no, under purpose. Okay, so your more specific purpose for this literary response is to explain your reaction. To explain your reaction. That's your specific purpose. Your general purpose is to inform. In writing, you always have some type of general purpose. Either you're trying to entertain people, or you're trying to inform people, or you're trying to persuade them. So your more general purpose is informed. Specific purpose is to explain your reaction. That's found on page two, I mean 415. You don't have to answer number six. Yeah, I'll go to um, question number one. I'll, I'll just freeze the screen on that. All right. So everybody should be open to page four thirteen. Uh, for the um, independent practice, I want you all to answer these questions, and I'm also going to attach some other questions also that we answered uh, prior. And the questions that we answered prior were just uh, the background questions to the story. So just so you know who the author and uh, some background information um, on the story, so you have some background information on the story, the other questions that come are for that. So. Uh, we've gone through multiple segments in this lesson. We've gone through um, a do now, um, which you should have your objective on your paper, your proper heading at the top. Uh, we've gone through an anticipatory set where we've introduced you to what we will be talking about. Uh, you've had your teach segment where we've uh, defined what it is that we were going to be discussing in this lesson, which we said by now you should be able to define an informative speech and you should be able to construct one. And so now that's what we're seeing in the independent practice. Are you able to construct one based on what you've learned? And we've done we've read a student model together. That was the class practice. You've uh, done a check for understanding to see what you actually retained from the teaching of it. That was the exit ticket. And uh, you've seen some examples. And now let's see if you can construct it. And that's an independent practice. Good luck.